Very good. Well, let, let me launch into my lengthy introduction. I hope it doesn't take too long today. And there's a few things to talk about. Number one, notice that uh, there's no chat available. It's just a q and A. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, this session is being recorded. And uh, I meant to start the recording just now, but actually we'll trim all of that, the, the talk that we had before this. So keep in mind, uh, this will be recorded for those who are uh, tuning in today or not able to tune in today, the uh, benefit of that is that this will be posted on YouTube. Uh, Ed has graciously uh, accepted that, uh, that we record and post this. The Q&A is the one mechanism for submitting questions today. Please post your questions through the Q&A at any time. Uh, we'll, we'll curate those and we'll get to questions at the end. If you are participating here as a professional engineer and you are in need of professional development hours, uh, PDHs, this event counts as one professional development hour. And in order to keep people honest, we're, we're not asking you um, if you need a certificate now, but we'll ask you at the end of the presentation. At the end, there will be a poll. You can click yes or no. If you'd like a PDH certificate sent to you, it will be sent to the email address that you registered with. And this is probably an opportune moment to say this is not only the Osterberg lecture here at Northwestern, it's also the May meeting of the Chicago uh, chapter of the Geo Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers. So we have a, a, a diverse audience of academics, practitioners, students, uh, everyone is joining us here today. Back to being the Osterberg lecture, we have the privilege here of the, the first virtual or remote, as we discussed er, uh, earlier, uh, Osterberg lecture, one of a kind. It's unfortunate that we can't do this in person. One day uh, we'll, we'll have Professor Cavazanjian back, although he's been to Northwestern certainly before. But a bit about the Osterberg lecture itself. It's named in honor of George Osterberg, one of the true pioneers of geotechnical engineering. This is an endowed lecture, uh, which is a memorial to Professor Osterberg's lifelong contributions to geotechnical engineering, including innovations in design and testing of deep foundations. He enjoyed a long and distinguished career as a professor of civil engineering here at Northwestern University and as a highly respected teacher and consultant. Um, recent Osterberg lecturers, in addition to Professor Cavazanjian, are Jonathan Bray, David Muir Wood, Guy Holsby, Ian Moore, Chino Vijani, Kenichi Soga. Ronnie Borja, Carlos Santarina, Santa Marina, and, uh, and many others in, in uh, recent years. A, a bit back to the, to the Chicago chapter in Geo Institute, please uh, keep abreast of what's happening in the Geo Institute. I won't go into all of the many things that have happened recently and will be happening soon. If you want to keep uh, in, uh, stay tuned on that, go to Twitter is my suggestion. Brad Keeler is very active there and events are regularly posted there. So stay, stay up to date on Twitter. And finally, uh, we come to the main event, which is Professor Cavazanjian himself. Let me say a few words. He is uh, a Regents Professor and the Ira A. Fulton Professor of Geotechnical Engineering in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment at Arizona State University. Before I forget, he had this on, on his background a minute ago. I want to mention that he is the director of the Center for Biomediated and Bioinspired Geotechnics, the National Science Foundation funded center that we're very privileged to have in the geo area. He has a holds a bas uh, bachelor's and master's degree from MIT, PhD from UC Berkeley. He has the distinction of spending considerable time in practice, 20 years in engineering practice before going to ASU. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a recipient of numerous awards, which I'm not going to list, list here, except for one, which is that next year he is going to deliver the 2022 Tertsagi Lecture. And the topic today is coordinated so as not to overlap with the, the content of the Tertsagi Lecture. And uh, you'll be hearing about different things today. You'll hear more from Professor Cavazanjian next year if, you, if you're able to tune in for that or be there. And the final thing that I want to say, which is really a distinction of Professor Cavazanjian's is that he is a, a extraordinary benefactor. He is providing a matching gift of $125,000 to the Student Participation Fund in the GEO Institute. What I will do is uh, post the link, please consider donating to the GEO Institute for the Student Participation Fund. If you do, 
Professor Cavazanjian will match your donation, which is really a remarkable thing uh, for all of us. Let's take advantage of that. I'll also post the link. This is on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the GEO Institute, and I will post the link to the YouTube video that um, celebrates that. So links to follow in the chat, keep in mind Q&A, and, and uh, Ed, I hand it over to you to share your presentation and uh, carry on. Thank you. All right. We go to presentation mode. Switch screens. Okay, well, thank you, Jim, for that kind introduction. And thank you for the honor of delivering the Osterberg Lecture. Uh, I'm flattered to join that the list of, of uh, very impressive list of past lectures. I met Professor Osterberg a couple of times at GI events and, and always enjoyed my conversations with him. Um, I appreciate uh, his contributions to geotechnical engineering, not only his direct contributions, but his indirect contributions to the legacy of geotechnical excellence at Northwestern that he established. So uh, I'm honored and flattered to be asked to give this lecture. And uh, it gave me a chance to pull together um, some work that I've been doing um, on landfills over the last decade or maybe even going back 20 years, um, uh, a little outside of, of what I talk about most of the time these days. As, as Jim mentioned, uh, my Terzaghi lecture will be on biomediated and bio-inspired geotechnics, but I've kept my hand in on landfill analyses, uh, landfill design, uh, we had one paper just accepted for publication, another one pending that I'll be talking about today. So I want to talk about some new insights that some advanced numerical analyses have given us on waste liner interaction in landfills. And uh, the, the main message here is regarding tensile stresses. So tensile stresses are perhaps the greatest threat to the integrity of a lined landfill containment system. Um, typically though, whoops, I was just trying to minimize something on my screen here. I think I'd get good at Zoom after, after all this time. Um, so typically tensile stresses are only evaluated uh, in, in basically during installation and, and construction. Um, we typically look at wind uplift. We look at thermal expansion and contraction. Um, puncture of the geomembrane depends upon the tensile stress. Uh, and sometimes we check the veneer stability, usually just for the cover, but we might also check it for waste placement against the side slope. But the post-construction stresses in the landfill are usually not considered in design. This despite the fact that, that landfills are subject to large amounts of settlement. A, a typical number you hear is uh, even after placement of the final lift of waste, landfills will settle as much as 20% of their thickness. So we have an initial uh, configuration of closure and in the post-closure period it settles that settle puts down drag on the side slope liner um, and st tensile stresses in the liner, particularly around the benches and then near the top of slopes. Um, and uh, as you'll see that those tensile stresses can be of serious concern. If we want to evaluate those stresses, it does take an advanced numerical analysis. One of the reasons we can check wind uplift and thermal stresses is it's relatively easy to do with some closed form solutions if we wanna see what the impact of waste set waste placement, waste settlement and seismic loading is on the stresses in the liner, we have to go to uh, more sophisticated analyses, more detailed analyses, more costly analyses. And I think that's been an inhibiting factor. Although people are getting better at these analyses and, and they're getting more efficient in conducting them. So the conventional wisdom, um, whoops, is that tension, Post installation or post placement of the waste is met, or post installation is managed by details and waste placement. Um, we place the waste on a side slope to maintain veneer stability and minimize tension. Um, we don't allow horizontal seams on the slope because there's a potential for strain concentrations or strain amplification at a horizontal seam on, in a liner that's in tension. So most specifications say no horizontal seams on slopes. Although I've reviewed a couple of designs that, that don't necessarily comply with that strictly. Um, one technique that people use is the idea of pre, pre designing with an engineered slip layer where the interface uh, above the liner, where the interface strength is lower 
than the interface strength of the liner. So if we look down at the bottom here, uh, if I have a normal stress sigma n acting on the geomembrane, the maximum shear stress that that geomembrane can, can hold is, is that normal stress times the sine of the interface friction angle with the top of the geomembrane. The available resistance at the bottom of the geomembrane is that same normal stress times the sine of the interface friction angle at the bottom. If the friction angle at the top is less than the friction angle at the bottom, um, then that driving stress, that tau max, cannot exceed the available resistance. And so we assume there'll be no tension. As you'll see, that's not necessarily a valid assumption. Um, but th that's been talked about and presented uh, in, in, at different conferences. This is a paper that I co-authored with Rick Thiel and one of my graduate students, Shuan Wu, uh, at the International 10th International Conference on Geosynthetics, illustrating the idea where here we have a, a cushion geotextile on top of the geomembrane. And then we have a, a slip layer. It could be another geotextile. It could be a geonet that has a lower interface friction angle than the interface friction angle between the, the cushion geotextile and the geomembrane. And that allows the waste to slip without transferring significant stresses to the underlying liner. If we wanna be more exact, if we wanna actually quantify the strains, um, we have to conduct numerical modeling. And, and the platforms for conducting numerical analysis are now ubiquitous. FLAC, Plaxis, there, I'm sure there are other ones out there. Those are the two most common. Um, but the key to accurate analysis are the constitutive models that we use, the models we use for the liner interface, the models that we use for the liner materials, and the models that we use for waste behavior. So we need sophisticated models and, and we need to validate these models if we're gonna have any confidence in the results of these analyses. So the model that I'll talk about today uses FLAC, so it's a finite difference model. Um, we model the geomembrane with beam elements, uh, nonlinear elastic beam elements. And this was an approach first used by Gary Fomes and Neil Dixon and their coworkers using FLAC. Um, to take into account the fact that, that the geomembranes can buckle, we give those beam elements a zero moment of inertia uh, in the axial direction. And so that's how we model the, the behavior of the geomembrane in compression. We use the FLAC macro language uh, to install some user-defined constitutive models. We have a constitutive model for interface elements, which allows for a post-peak strength decrease, a peak and then a large displacement or residual strength. We've, we've changed the behavior of those beam elements from linear elastic to nonlinear elastic based on some work done by J.P. Giroux. Uh, we have a model for the hysteretic and degrading uh, behavior of geosynthetic clay liners that are commonly used in landfill liners. And we have taken steps to validate these models using model test results, case histories, and parametric studies that have allowed us to investigate the factors that influence liner tensile stresses. So here's our interface model. This is based on work done at Virginia Tech by Esther Hughes and, and his coworkers, where they found that the uh, mobilized strength uh, at a geosynthetics interface is a function of the cumulative relative shear displacement. And this includes cumulative displacements in cyclic loading, where uh, the, the loading on both sides of, of the, the null point are, are added up. Uh, and this shows some of the results of their studies of, of the mobilized shear stress uh, versus relative displacement. So in our model, um, you have a, a peak stress that's mobilized up to a certain strain at which you exceed the peak. And then we degrade to residual stress based upon this kind of um, parabolic or hyperbolic uh, decay. Uh, and uh, we can capture not just static loading, but also hysteretic cyclic loading with it. Here's an example of uh, the calculated and, and um, observed cyclic loading uh, at, an, at a geosynthetic interface, an interface between a geosynthetic clay liner in this case, and a geomembrane where the, the interface strength was lower than the internal strength of the GCL. And so the shear was happening at that interface. The dashed line shows the measured response and the solid lines show the cyclic response. And, and so our model does a pretty good job of capturing both the static decrease in strength and the cyclic behavior. Um, for, for, the, oops, for the internal strength of the GCL, and we can use this for any other materials, uh, 
Um, we used a different model and this was like stepping into the way back machine for me. I went back almost 30 years to some work I did at Stanford with Saeed Salamars, where uh, following on the work of Prevost, we developed the kinematic hardening isotropic softening nested plasticity model. So we have a series of nested yield surfaces um, that expand as, as uh, they're loaded. Um, however, this last yield surface uh, is, is a softening yield surface and it collapses on an isotropic hardening surface that, that prevents it from becoming unstable. And in this way, we can capture both a peak and a large displacement um, strength uh, of any material. And again, here's some comparisons between um, cyclic loading uh, of the GCL where we're shearing the internal strength that here the GCL was saturated um, and uh, uh, comparing, well, these are the experimental results and here we're comparing the experimental results through a numerical solution. This is some work we did with Pat Fox um, about eight years ago uh, in developing this constitutive model. For the G-membrane itself, we go back to the work that J.P. Giroux did. Uh, he first presented this, I think, in 1994, but he has a 2005 landmark paper on the properties of geosynthetic materials um, where he developed this parabolic stress-strain curve for HDP geomembranes before yield, actually for any geomembrane. Um, and it's a function, the behavior is a function of the exponent n. And for HDP, that n is equal to 4. Uh, and he's also able to capture the effect of temperature based upon its effect on the yield stress. So the, the stress strain curve is normalized with respect to the yield stress and the yield strain. Um, and we can account for temperature effects, which is something that I have on my to-do list because in these bioreactor landfills that are becoming more and more prevalent, we're seeing higher and higher temperatures. Um, and I have to wonder how these high temperatures are going to affect the performance of our liner systems. Um, so we conducted a number of validation studies of these models. Um, using model studies, we looked at the um, uh, performance of a block on a plane. There are a lot of these where people were looking at the accuracy of the so-called Newmark type analyses for seismic displacement. Um, some on a horizontal plane where we've looked at base isolation, frictional base isolation using geosynthetic materials. Some on an inclined plane to see how accurate these Newmark analyses are. Uh, and then we've also used the models to do parametric analyses of landfills looking at the effect of slip at the liner interface, um, the side slope line of forces and strains due to waste settlement. Uh, and and we've, we've validated it using um, a centrifuge model that should be singular. So geosynthetic base isolation, this is a technique uh, we first presented in a paper back in 1991, um, kind of interesting background in 1988, I was working as a consultant for Parsons Brinkerhoff in New York, and we were asked to do peer review on a plan to uh, build a, a four kilometer long cable state bridge across the Gulf of Corinth in Greece. And one of the piers, these were large gravity piers, 90 meters in diameter. And one of the piers for the towers was on a soft clay foundation. And the factor of safety against sliding was less than one. And the French designer said, well, this is a good thing. This is base isolation. This will limit the stresses that are transferred to the tower. Now, our peer review comment was, well, uh, that sounds good, but if you really want to put a slip layer in there, you, you need to engineer the slip layer so you know that it's going to slip where you want it to slip and not rely upon the strength of a natural soil deposit. The French engineers just enlarged the size of the, the, the footing to 100 meters um, rather than deal with that. Um, but it planted a seed that we first explored in the 1991 paper for a Lifeline Earthquake Engineering Conference. Meshach Yegian at Northeastern then pursued this in 1998 and 2004 papers. Um, and both of us conducted uh, shake table tests of a rigid block uh, lined with the geosynthetic on, on top of a shaking table line with the geosynthetic to validate the concept. So if we look over here on the right-hand side, the green lines and the dash lines are, are the loading uh, of the base. Uh, and then here's the response to the block. And, and very nicely, there's a little bit of an offset here from the zero, but you can see very nicely that when the block acceleration exceeds the tangent of phi, which is the interface friction angle, um, it slips. And it slips until the block acceleration decreases below um, tangent of phi. And then 
uh, by that time, we're, we're exceeding, uh, the, the, the direction of, of shaking is reversed, and so then we exceed the yield acceleration in the other direction. And so we get this stick slip behavior that basically isolates the block from high accelerations. And again, the dashed lines here show, well, the, here the solid line, the thin solid line shows our numerical analysis. Here the dashed line shows um, our numerical analysis of the relative displacement between the block and the plane compared to what we measured with the LVDTs. And in this case, we use a simple elastoplastic um, interface model, not the hyperbolic um, or, or degrading model that we used before, uh, because this interface didn't have a, a, a very much difference between the peak and the large displacement strain. Um, others then have done similar tests using an inclined plane on the shaking table. Um, perhaps the best one to refer to are those done by Joe Wartman at Berkeley with Ray Seed and others. Um, and again, using our model, and in this case, we use the, the Esther Huizen based model. Um, we were able to closely reproduce their results, um, both in terms of the cumulative displacement as the block ratchets its way down the slope. And uh, one of the parameters they calculate, it was the average sliding velocity of the block as a function of friction angle. Um, and uh, they have experimental results with small and large displacement for a number of different friction angles. And our numerical results were pretty close to their experimental results. Well, so those are fine, but they're not really landfill analyses. So uh, for, with one of my PhD students, we did a large scale centrifuge test at UC Davis, where we built a model landfill we uh, lined, we, we had a soil cemented foundation to provide, soil cemented sand foundation to provide us a firm foundation. We built in uh, two different side slope orientations um, with one bench so we could capture the performance around the benches. Um, the, the model itself was about two feet tall, um, but we accelerated it up to 60 Gs. So our, our length scale prototype the model was 60, so this half a, half a meter uh, deposit of waste uh, became a 32 meter deposit of waste, 100 feet of waste. And we shook it with progressively increasing motions. This shows our instrumentation, LVDTs at the surface to capture the settlement, accelerometers spaced throughout the model, and then thin film strain gauges on the geomembrane around the benches near the surface and on the base of the model. Now, one of the nice things, or one of the, the issues in centrifuge modeling are the stresses that are induced as you spin your model up. We thought that was a good thing because that enabled us to model the effect of waste settlement in terms of inducing strains in the liner. So as we spun up the model, our landfill deposit, our simulated waste settled about 14% of its thickness. So at the prototype scale, this 32 meters of waste settled about five meters. Um, and, and that was enough to induce some significant strains in the geomembrane. The geomembrane was also a specialty geomembrane because you have to scale the stress strain response of all of the elements um, in um, your model. And, and so we had to buy a, a very expensive piece of specialty membrane used to make um, uh, high-tech batteries. Um, it, to, in order to model uh, the thickness actually of the membrane properly. Um, and so I won't show all the results here. They're in a paper that was co-authored with Andrew Gutierrez, my PhD student. But if we look at the maximum cumulative tensile strain after settlement, in other words, after we spun the model up, and, and that was the strain at the benches, um, we had remarkable agreement between the experimental results on both the one-to-one one -one side and the two-to-one -one side of the model and numerical results with, with strains of almost 5% in both cases. And then when we looked at the cumulative tensile strain after seismic loading, and, and we loaded it up to 0.6 G uh, acceleration with a random motion um, that was input to the centrifuge shake table. Um, well, one of the strain gauges uh, stopped functioning, but again, we had pretty good agreement. Um, on a one-to-one -one slope, 9% was the uh, numerical value, no experimental results available. On the two-to-one slope, 8.3% strain versus 8.1%. Um, so very, very, we were really pleased with the results um, of those in, that analysis. 
Uh, and this may not sound like a lot of strain. 4% may not sound like a lot of strain. 9%, it's getting there. The tensile strain of HCP geomembranes are typically on the order of 11 to 14%, depending on the geomembrane. But as you'll see, there are a lot of factors that we need to consider that make these strain le levels perhaps unacceptable for line of performance. Um, one of the first analyses we did, whoops, uh, with our, our, our model was we evaluated the performance of a, of a heap leach pad for a, um, uh, a mining project. Uh, and this was uh, kind of a conventional heap leach, a nice flat liner with a 2% slope. Um, we, we looked at three cases. We wanted to see, well, would we get, would we get an accurate response for the heap leach pad uh, if we just use an interface element between the ore pile and the foundation? We modeled the actual system of a, a cushion geotex uh, of a geomembrane with interfaces on both sides. And of course, we also modeled the case with no interface in order to see what the effect of, of these slip at these interfaces were. were. Um, Interesting, uh, even when we had a case where the PG, the peak ground acceleration exceeded the yield acceleration of the geomembrane, we still got significant tensile stresses in the membrane, uh, belying this philosophy that if we have that lower interface strength on the top, we're not going to have any tensile strain, um, mostly due to the anchoring of the geomembrane. You know, so the geomembrane is rigidly anchored, typically by an anchor trench at both sides. And so as it stretches in uh, in, in response to the, to the shear stresses, even below yield, it does induce tension in the geomembrane. And, and here the tension is shown in gray. Um, we also get some compression as the waste shakes back in the other, other way. And on a downhill side, we get slightly greater tension. Most of the time, the tension was pretty manageable. We used six different motions. Uh, for five of the motions, the tensile strains were, uh, due to seismic shaking, two to 5%. Um, but for one case, the Landers earthquake, we had some very high tensile strains. So th that's what's shown here, the results for the Landers earthquake with tensile strains on the order of um, 12%, uh, which is getting pretty close to yield. Um, we also then wanted to see how the cumulative displacement along the geomembrane um, in the downslope direction matched up with some Newmark analyses. Um, and so here are the results of the decoupled Newmark analyses where we took the seismic response of the waste without an interface and then popped that into the sliding block model and calculated the resulting displacements. And we compared that to the displacements actually at four points in the liner, A, C, D, E, and B, but A and B are the relevant points there at the ends of the liner. So if we look at A and B, we, we find that in most, well, actually, if we look at all four of these, D and C are in the middle of the liner, we find that the, the Newmark displacement was, was a pretty good average of the displacement at the four points, but that the maximum displacements predicted by the Newmark analysis uh, were, or the Newmark, the displacements predicted by the Newmark analysis were less in most cases than the maximum displacement at the two ends. In some cases, um, significantly less. So that's some of the analyses we did with our, our interface models um, for uh, landfill liner response. Um, more recently, we've developed a model to account for mass loss and decomposition of waste um, after it's placed in the landfill. So here's our old friend, the phase diagram for soils. And, and rather than just having voids and, and soil solids, now we have voids. We have some decomposable solids and then we have some inert solids that aren't going to decompose. And so as this waste settles, we have three components to the settlement. We have some compression due to the load. We have some compression if we're under a constant load due to, um, this says creep, but really due to, um, well, yeah, due, due to mechanical creep. And then we have some settlement due to decomposition of the waste. Uh, and we've implemented this model within a modified cam clay model. So this is a modified modified cam clay model. Um, and it takes into account both the hardening that happens as these organics decompose, and we have a higher percentage of inert, weight, inert waste, and the settlement or the volume change that occurs as the waste degrades. And we, we calibrated or that, tried to validate that model um, using results, one-dimensional settlement results from the deer track bioreactor experiment 
conducted by Barreiter and his colleagues. And this was a very large scale uh, experiment. This was a 2.4 meter diameter, an eight foot diameter steel cylinder that was 8.2 meters, 27 feet tall. They packed the waste in in three lifts and put a settlement gauge on the top of each lift. So uh, P1 uh, would be, uh, P4 would be the first, uh, the, the top settlement plate, P1 would be the settlement plate on the first lift. Um, and the rate of settlement after the initial loading, which is this initial steep decline of these curves on cumulative vertical strain versus time, um, is a function of the kinetic rate constant K. In this case, K is not permeability. It's a kinetic rate constant that describes the rate at which the, so the, the decomposable solids decompose. And using our best estimate of the kinetic weight constant based upon laboratory studies of waste decomposition, um, we got, well, pretty good agreement with the, the top two lifts of waste. Uh, the bottom two lifts, we started to get some divergence. Um, we did some inverse analyses. Uh, where we, we changed the kinetic rate constants. And of course, we were able to get better agreement once we started juggling the parameters um, to uh, match the results. This gave us some confidence that at least the patterns of displacement that we were going to predict in terms of vertical strains due to decomposition um, were going to be realistic. Um, and so we, we decided to look at the effect of waste decomposition on the performance of landfill liner systems. We created a base case model, uh, three 40 meter tall uh, slopes, so 100 meter, 120 meter tall landfill uh, uh, below grade, and another 40 meters above grade, another 120 meters above grade, so a pretty big landfill, in keeping with the large mega landfills that are now being uh, built in the US. Um, four meter wide benches, 2% uh, base grade on the base of the landfill, uh, we placed the waste in 12 lifts at 30-day intervals, and we looked at the response to three different sets of interface strengths. One set where the friction angle at the top was 20 degrees and the friction angle at the bottom of the G membrane was 10. One case where the friction angle at the top was 20 and on the bottom was 16. And then the one case of the engineered slip layer where the friction angle at the top was 15 and a half degrees and the friction angle at the bottom was 25 degrees. And this is a, a study that was just uh, submitted for publication to geo, geotextile and geomembranes. So here are some results on the base case. Um, and so here we're going to look at the strains at the end of stage L4. That's with uh, the waste placed up to the top of the second bench. Um, at the end of stage L5, that's the waste placed halfway up to the, to, to the ground surface from the second bench. Um, the end of stage L8, that's when we've topped out the waste. And then three years, 180 days after placing the, ca the cap on the landfill to see will the stresses continue to increase in that post-construction period. And one thing you can see dramatically here is, is the effect of that interface friction angle. Um, when the interface in set three, when the interface friction angle at the top was less than the interface friction angle at the bottom, even with these steep slopes, um, we had pretty manageable strains, 5% um, uh, at the end of, of filling, 8% um, uh, 100, 100 days after filling. So still getting kind of up there, um, but not as much as we had with case one, um, where it's 13.5%. Excuse me, it was 1% uh, or 3% or for the interface slip case um, at the end of filling and 4.6%. Uh, 180 days after filling. So clear, there's a clear benefit to either minimizing the difference between those friction angles or having a lower friction angle on top of the membrane. But interestingly, in that post-closure period, while the waste continued to degrade, we continued to develop tensile strains in the liner. And I think that was a fairly important finding. Even on the base, even down here at the base, we started to get some tensile strains right here in the corner where the base connected to the side slope. Um, we also uh, took a look at the uh, influence of time by, um, uh, excuse me, here we, we, we compared, we looked at the influence of time by comparing the results for our model, the MSW model, to a model in which we suppressed 
the uh, time dependent um, waste decomposition. So basically to results we would predict with a conventional cam clay uh, model. Um, and at least initially relatively small difference between the results. Um, but as we cap the landfill, we start to see some significant difference on the time dependent strains. That's because we've had more volumetric change with longer times. And in the post closure period, it makes a big difference in terms of the strains we're mobilizing when we allow the waste to decompose. Uh, it, can, it, it does in part larger strains. In the modified cam clay model, there's almost essentially no effect uh, of time after closure, right? At the end of closure, we have 5.2%, 5.3% on the benches. Um, 180 days later, we're still at 5.2%, 5.4%. For all intents and purposes, that's the same strain. Um, but with the time dependent model, we've doubled the strain from 5.2 to 10% on that first bench. Um, so uh, the message here is that just because you've capped your landfill doesn't mean you can forget about uh, stresses on the liner system. Um, we took a look at the effect of the side slope lane, put some additional benches in. We doubled the number of benches. So now we only have a 20 foot high uh, slope before we put the bench in. Uh, I think most landfill constructors would prefer that we don't do that, but, but it did have a measurable effect on the strains, um, reducing the strains on the benches. Um, although still after capping, we still had some fairly large strains, 9.3%, 5.8% uh, as we place the cover load, and then 9% um, on really this second bench up here um, after capping. Um, if you really want to control the, the strains, though, one way to do it is to flatten the slope angle. And so here we flattened our slope angle to three to one. Now, again, there's a price for that because that reduces the capacity of the landfill. Um, but in reducing that slope to three to one, we, it had a significant impact. And this is with interface strength set one. This is with the worst case, 20 degrees on top and 10 degrees on the bottom. And here, uh, even after closure, we still have relatively manageable strains the highest strain of 5% being right here at the ground surface, certainly a place where we could probably take some remedial action um, if we started having problems with our geomembrane. So those are some of the parametric studies we did to, to try and validate our model and show that, that uh, we, we were getting some at least intuitively uh, acceptable results. Um, let's look at how it compares with some, some case history analyses where we have some actual measured side slope strains and observed seismic response. Um, side slope liner strains, um, there are really only two case histories in, in the literature to uh, look at. Um, one is for a bioreactor landfill in Yolo County in California by Yazdani and all, where they uh, instrumented the, the, the liner system with strain gauges and they measured the strains in the liner. Um, and the only problem with this drawing, uh, no, is yes, that, that, it's, that uh, it's reverse. So this lower trace here is actually the strain down here at the toe of the landfill. And this trace up here is the strain up here at the crest uh, where the tensile stresses are the highest. This is tension, this is compression. And so you can see that up near the, near the base of the landfill as the waste settles, we're getting compression but near the top of the landfill, we're getting tension. Um, J.P. Gork uh, in France did, a, did an, uh, an experiment where he uh, put a large weight. He built a side slope liner. He, he suspended a large weight from a cable, and then he let the weight slide down and measured the strains in the liner. And we see the same pattern of displacement with compression at the toe and then tension at the head um, <coughs> with that tension increasing as uh, the, the length of the slope increased. Um, and we compare that to a numerical analysis and we see the same patterns of behavior, right? We see tension, at the, uh, compression at the toe and, and tension uh, up at the crest uh, with relatively neutral strains in the middle. And, and, and so that gives us some confidence uh, that we're at least predicting the right pattern of behavior. Um, we also, compared our waste degradation model to the settlement of the OII uh, landfill. Um, this was the subject of a PEC lecture I gave a number of years ago. This is a major Superfund site in the Los Angeles basin. Um, this is OII, unlined landfill, one-to-one -one slopes adjacent to a major freeway. 
Um, it's about 300 feet of waste, about 120 feet, as I remember, above grade. Um, we did some extensive investigation, um, uh, spectral analysis, surface wave surveys with Ken Stokey, three large diameter boreholes. A lot of the, what we know about how uh, the mechanical properties of waste comes from the testing done on the waste we recovered from this landfill. Um, and they also had some seismic records in this landfill, which was of interest to us. We created three cross sections through the landfill. We're gonna look at cross section three, three here through the Northern end of the landfill where the waste was relatively dry. Um, or no, I think we can look at cross section two, two here at the Southern end of the landfill where they co-disposed liquids with the waste. So there was a lot of settlement and a lot of waste degradation. Um, and so this is cross section two, two and, and the color coding here shows the age of the waste. This was a challenging case history because we only had the data after waste placement was done. So the waste had already undergone uh, 30, this, this lower layer here had already undergone 20 years of degradation. This layer had undergone 15 years of degradation. And so we kind of had to catch up to where the landfill was at the time of closure, which was in 1992. They had surface um, monuments at, at uh, five points along the landfill. Um, and we compared our results to results that Geosinta got using a, a another form of the cam clay model, a double yield surface cam clay model that included not just um, an elliptical yield surface for volumetric strains, but within that elliptical yield surface, a horizontal yield surface for deviatoric strains. It's pretty well recognized that the conventional modified cam clay model under predicts shear strains. It's calibrated on one dimensional compression strains and when you load it up with stress ratios that are greater than one the one dimensional stress ratio, it under predicts the shear strains. And so some work I did back at Stanford with Ronnie Borja and, and Xi Xie Sheng, um, we created a double yield surface model that included these deviatoric yield surfaces within the cam clay yield ellipse and geosyntax back in 96 used that model to predict the strains at OII. If we look at vertical displacement, um, both the measured values here, uh, the, the black line. Uh, our, our study had a little bit better agreement than the ge geosyntax study, although you would argue that both of them showed as good as you could expect. Um, we did fall short on the horizontal displacements, which are very sensitive to the shear strains, to the DV torque strains. And we attribute that to the fact that we did not, in our MSW model, we did not include um, the DV torque yield surface. So that's on my to-do list. If I get another student who wants to work on landfills, we will extend this model to include the double yield surface model. Um, and then uh, in terms of interface strength, um, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the performance of the Chiquita Canyon landfill in the 1994 Northridge earthquake. And that's really what started me along this um, path of flak modeling using advanced constitutive models for geosynthetic materials and interfaces. Uh, in the Northridge earthquake, um, the Chiquita Canyon landfill, the liner at the Ch Chiquita Canyon landfill tore in two places. And this was of great concern because up to that earthquake, the conventional wisdom was that uh, geosynthetic line landfills perform well in earthquakes. Of course, there was very limited experience with that. In fact, there was no real experience with that. Um, some experience from a 1974 earthquake that was 100 kilometers away from the line landfills, but they weren't shaken very strong. Here we had three or four line landfills in the upper central region, and one of them experienced tears at two locations. Uh, and the other landfills, who knows, there, there might have been tears beneath the waste where we couldn't see. Here it became obvious because the tears were right at the crest of the slopes. So uh, Canyon C and Canyon D were the two locations where the, where the tears occurred. And you can see the tear in Canyon D, kind of an on echelon tear uh, at the crest of the slope. And in fact, this tear was covered with cover soil and was only detected uh, during landfill gas monitoring after the earthquake. They, they detected a uh, large um, amount of landfill gas. Uh, they excavated down and they found the tears in the geomembrane. So, we built our flak model whoops, using our advanced constitutive models, expecting to see that in, in this earthquake and Chiquita Canyon was in the epicentral region of the earthquake. It was subjected to uh, accelerations order 0.4, 0.5 G. 
We had strong motion records from very close to the landfill, so we could use those for our analyses. Uh, and so we expected to see some very high strains in the landfill leading to these tears. And lo and behold, uh, we didn't. We had relatively small strains, tensile strains of 4% in Canyon C and 2% in Canyon D. So we really had to scratch our heads and ask, you know, what, what was going on here? Why, why were we getting such low tensile strains? And yet the membrane was tearing. Um, so when we look at these, the tensile strains were in the correct location. They were at the crest of the slope near or at an anchor where the landfill is fixed. But the maximums were much less than the HCP uniaxial yield strain. We had CQA data for this particular geomembrane that said the yield strain was around 13%. And we're looking at strains of, of less than 4% in one case and less than 2.5% in the other case. So it begged the question, why did the geomembranes tear at these locations? And the answer is that there are a number of strain correction factors that need to be added when you look at the performance of a geomembrane. We need to apply a correction factor to the fact that we're measuring the yield strain in a uniaxial tension test and the yield strain in plane strain is gonna be less than a yield strain in uniaxial tension. We need to apply a correction factor because the yield strain in the geomembrane will, be de will, be, will decrease if there are scratches in the geomembrane that are perpendicular to the direction of the tensile stress. And we need to account for the fact that the tensile strain <coughs> along a seam that's perpendicular to the uh, applied strain uh, will be amplified, that there's increased tensile strain through the bending at seams in the geomembrane. Let's take a look at these factors. So in terms of the uniaxial yield strain correction for plane strain, like much in the geomembrane geo, uh, world, this goes back to J.P. Giroux in his 19, 2005 paper. Um, and he de derived an equation based on Poisson's ratio that says the yield strain in plane strain is equal to the yield strain in, uniaxial, in a uniaxial test times one minus Poisson's ratio over the square root of one minus Poisson's ratio minus Poisson's ratio squared. So if we assume a Poisson's ratio is 0 0.46, which is appropriate for um, a, a strain of about 12% in a geomembrane, we find that this, this should say EYPS, this reduces the plane strain yield strain from 13% to 11.8%. Not a big reduction, uh, certainly not getting us down to the values that we were measuring in our analysis. Let's look at strat scratches. So because the behavior, the stress strain behavior of a geomembrane takes a nonlinear elastic form, and this is nonlinear elastic. If you unload it before yield, it'll, it'll come back along the same curve. Um, due to the nonlinear behavior of this curve, small changes in stress can pro produce disproportionate increases in strain as you approach yield. So if we're originally close to yield, and we put a notch in the geomembrane, and we reduce the cross-section area of the geomembrane, we increase the stress, we get a stress increment um, due to the decrease in the thickness of the geomembrane, a small stress increment can cause a very large change in the strain and bring us to yield. And so if we look at that, um, we look over here at the right-hand side. Here, this is a plot that was developed from Giroux's equation of the yield strain of a scratched geomembrane versus the yield strain of an intact geomembrane. And here, we're, this is the normalized yield strain. This is the scratch depth as a, as a function of the geomembrane thickness, a thickness of just a scratch thickness of one-tenth of the thickness of the geomembrane will reduce that yield strain by over half. And one tenth. So uh, the geomembrane at um, Chiquita Canyon was 80 mils thick, 80 thousandths of an inch. So eight thousandths of an inch, a hundredth of an inch thick scratch is enough to reduce the yield strain by a factor of two. And we know we're going to have scratches in the geomembrane, particularly where they put patches um, around um, cutouts for construction quality assurance sampling. So this is a picture from a side slope line of construction at the Lopez Canyon landfill. You see the, the worker roped off and he's doing what's called grinding the seam. So they cut a patch out of the seam at this location for construction quality assurance testing. Then they put a patch over it and they welded that patch with an extrusion weld. Well, to get a good bind between the patch and the parent geomembrane, you have to grind off the oxidized upper layer of the geomembrane. 
that inevitably creates scratches in the gene membrane. So we're scratching the gene membrane here, and we're putting in a seam, a few, uh, an extrusion seam that's perpendicular to the direction of the tensile stress at the location where the tensile stress is likely to be the highest. Not a good combination of effects. <clears throat> and, and so that brings me to um, the last correction factor we have to consider. And that is that for strains perpendicular to the tensile stress direction, the inevitable bending of the strain creates inevitable additional tensile strain. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a perfect fusion strain where, uh, scene where we fuse two geomembranes together. When we stretch this geomembrane, so that the portions of the geomembrane away from the seam are cold planar, the seam has to bend in order to accommodate that de deformation. And so as the seam bends, we get induced tensile stresses at the bending points here and here that are added to the tensile stress that's stretching the geomembrane. That effect is exacerbated by extrusion welds, the kind of weld that's used on those geomembrane patches. So we put a big blob of resin here to, to weld these two geomembranes together. And again, as we stretch them, this seam will bend so it becomes so that the membrane becomes coplanar away from the membrane. And so Giroux has a series of, of um, plots for different geomembrane thicknesses and for different seam widths. The width of the seam can be important. And so this is for a two millimeter or an 80 mil geomembrane, which is what we had at, at Chiquita Canyon, a typical width of 38 millimeters. If we look at that seam that had 2.15% or 2.2% strain, if we have a fusion well, this is number uh, curve number four, fusion well, um, <clears throat> the incremental bending strain is about 1.75%. If we have an extrusion weld, the incremental bending strain is 2.5%. So we now have gone from 2.1% strain to 4.6% strain. Uh, and if we have an extrusion weld with, with a lap, uh, and which is what we had at Chiquita Canyon, it actually bumps the strain income up even more to 2.75%. So now we're at 5% strain um, around the seam um, in that gene membrane. How does that compare to reality? Well, this is a picture from the forensic analysis conducted by MCON of uh, the, the tears at Chiquita Canyon following the earthquake. This is Canyon D. In fact, that seam ruptured right where you would expect it to rupture, right around the fusion weld. Um, and that created the tear that propagated through the membrane. If we look at Canyon C, this is where we had the lap weld. That tear occurred again, right at a point where we had uh, a fusion seam, um, but then we had a lap seam and we had a, a dual wedge seam under the patch. Uh, excuse me, we had an extrusion seam on the patch so we had a combination here of different types of seams, um, which led to strain concentrations. So when we take those strain concentrations into effect, we take into account the reduction of the yield factor safety, voila, we now have a factor of safety of 0 0.8 for a 0.15 millimeter scratch in the fillet weld in Canyon C, and we have a 0 0.8 factor of safety for the 1, 0.15 millimeter scratch to the fillet plus the lap weld um, in Canyon D. Sounds good. Um, those are some pretty dramatic reductions, uh, suggesting that strains of even two to three percent can can send a geomembrane uh, tensile strains of two to three percent can send a, send a geomembrane to yield. How reasonable are these strain concentrations? Well, we decided we needed to measure that. So, with one of my two of my students, Jake Andreessen uh, and and Angel Gutierrez, we set about measuring strain concentrations in geomembrane seams. And we contacted some geomembrane manufacturers. We got a collection of different types of seams. We modified our triaxial device so that um, after welding bars on the top and bottom of a geomembrane coupon, we could load them in, in some grips on the triaxial device and loaded in tension. Here is the, the geomembrane loaded in tension. And we speckled the geomembrane with white paint so we could use digital image correlation to measure the strains in the geomembrane as we stretched it. So here are some results. So um, now, of course, that experimental setup with the grips and the limited length is going to induce some um, non-uniform strain, strain concentration. So how uniform is the strain? <clears throat> well, here's the strain field on a two millimeter uh, plain specimen without seams that we stretch to an average strain of 6.1%. And if you look at the strains here, we have fairly uniform strains in the middle, 0.5%. 
um, somewhat greater than the average strain. So the strains on the edges of the coupons is lower, but in the middle, um, we're getting strains. We, the average strain between the top and bottom of the coupon, 6%, we're measuring strains of between seven and 8% in the middle of the coupon, fairly uniform over about half the width of the coupon. Here is the strain field for a two millimeter extrusion seam. So these are those, those blobs of, of, um, of resin that we, we use to hold the seams together. Of course, the seams here, but this is the edge of the seam that's going into bending. Um, here, the average strain on the seam was just 0.36%. If we look at the, the, the code down here, we see some areas of red in the seam here. We see a large area of yellow where, where the strain is on the order of one to one and a half percent. And then we see some higher areas of strain where the strains were as much as 1.8 percent. Here are the results for a fusion seam, a little bit more uniform, but still, uh, so this had an average strain at 2.7 percent. Uh, in the middle of the, the coupon, we're getting up to 5 percent, an amplification factor of two um, along the seam. Uh, so a little bit more uniform, a little bit less amplification than the extrusion seam but still some significant strain amplification. How does that compare? How do those results compare to what Giroux's equations were predicting? Well, here are three different strain levels. Here's the extrusion fillet seam, those big blobs of resin. Um, at low strains, um, this was the, the average strain in the gym membrane. This is what the Giroux equation would predict for the strain concentration. This is what we were measured. What we we measured around the seam, uh, and this was the maximum, the high points in the seam. When we looked at the individual pixels, and we picked out the maximum seam strain, th this was averaged over the length of the seam in the mid uh, in, in the middle half of the coupon. Um, this was th the maximum over that that side. So relatively good agreement between Giroux and what we measured, but the maximum. Which we, which we attribute to imperfections and non-uniformities in the seam was greater than the average and greater what Giroux predicted. And that pattern holds through all the way through. So here's a somewhat higher strain level. Again, what Giroux predicted, the average we measured in the seam and the maximum. Uh, and then we see the same pattern here <coughs> at the larger strain where Giroux and, and, and the DIC results are, are converging and the maximum is greater. With the uh, fusion seams, the discrepancy between what we were measuring, what Giroux was predicting, and what the maximum in the seam was, was even greater. Um, so one of the things we did with this data, so we also, we had over a hundred specimens, seam specimens from seek construction quality assurance that were provided to us by two consultants who did a lot of CQA work for geomembranes. And these were excess seams that they had. And so we, we failed those seams. We grabbed those seams and stretched them and we failed them in tension. We plotted up the results of the tensile strains on the seams. Um, it looked pretty much like a normal distribution to us. And so we used the parameters of that normal distribution to evaluate some confidence intervals for an assumed yield strain of 11%. What would the, the average strain have to be such that the um, strain in the G-membrane seam was below the yield strain. And basically all of our numbers there for 90% confidence, uh, the tensile strain maximum of 3.6% in one case with the, with the fusion weld, 3.6, 3.8, 2.4, 2 2.7 with the extrusion weld um, at 95% confidence. Um, a little bit less, 3.3, 3.7%, 2.2, 2.5%. Now, typically we say that the maximum allowable tensile strain in the gym membrane is 4%, um, but this argues that that limit should be even less. And then there are scratches. So here are the DIC results for some intentional scratches we put in, in an unscratched geomembrane coupon. This is a one millimeter or a 40 mil geomembrane with a scratch uh, 0.4 millimeters, so one tenth of the thickness. The average strain um, on the coupon was 2%. The maximum strain around the scratch was 4%. And then um, here's a, a gene membrane with a deeper scratch, a one millimeter gene membrane with a, whoops, something's wrong here. Um, oh no, these are both 0.4 millimeter scratches. So I, I take that back. 
Um, these are both uh, scratches to 40% of the membrane thickness. Um, and um, keep in mind that these scratches don't go all the way across the membrane. They were uh, just over a limited section of the membrane, which we think inhibited the strain a little bit. But again, here we have a max, an average strain of 5% and a maximum strain of 18% around the scratch. So these same strain concentrations and these concentrations around scratches um, are, are valid. They, they really do exist. So we concluded from these seams uh, and scratch test results that the average strain in a zone of strain concentration around a seam is closer to the Giroux value, but there's a maximum tensile strain that can be much greater than the average and up to four times the nominal or average tensile strain in the geomembrane. And, you know, geomembranes are pretty brittle materials. Once you start a tear, uh, the entire geomembrane tends to unzip. Um, that the yield strain due to scratches are greater than the Giroux values, but still reduced from that of virgin material. Whoops. Uh, and that the nominal average strains resulting in maximum strains equal to the yield strain may be as low as 2% for extrusion welds and 3% for fusion welds, which, which are lower than the 4% value and lower than what we were predicting in some of those um, analyses of the influence of waste settling. So what does it all mean? What are the conclusions we've drawn from the study? Well, we really need to pay more attention to the post-construction performance of our li liner systems. Um, and this requires an advanced numerical analysis. They, there may be strains occurring below the ground surface that, that are unacceptable and that could lead to, to breaches in the containment system. That the stresses may continue to increase after closure, um, although our constitutive model for decomposing waste needs more work. That's why I say may continue to increase. Um, that steep side slopes, remember we had the highest strains with those one-to-one -one side slopes, seems perpendicular to the tensile strains are of particular concern, but we have a number of mitigation measures that include flattening the slopes, putting seams in the gym membrane and, and taking QAQC samples at the toe of the slope instead of at the crest of the slope, using fusion seams rather than extrusion seams wherever possible, although they're not possible when you're patching um, an area where you took a sample for, for destructive testing. And we re need to rethink our anchoring details. Uh, I'm not a big fan of anchor trenches. I think it's better to anchor your gym membranes by running them out maybe in a shallow V trench and putting soil cover on top of them because just bending that gym membrane down into the anchor trench um, creates a, a, a large tensile stress and a large stress concentration that then will be susceptible to uh, amplification due to down drag of the waste. So uh, I want to thank my ASU co-authors and collaborators. Uh, these are basically students of mine who worked on these studies, Muhammad Arab, Angel Gutierrez, Jake Andreessen, and Wu Gao. Um, I want to thank other co-authors and collaborators on these studies, Nevin Matasevic, Pat Fox, James Sura, Chris Nye, Gary Fomes, and Neil Dixon. Uh, I, of course, have to thank J.P. Giroux, who was a mentor of mine when I worked at Geosyntec and um, is the father of, shall we say, rational analysis of geosynthetic systems, to use one of J.P.'s terms. The NSF Geotechnical Systems Geoenvironmental Engineering and Geohazards Mitigation Program that funded this work through a GOLI, Grant Opportunities for Academic Liaison with Industry Project on the Integrity of Geosynthetic Barriers of Waste Containment uh, subject to large settlements of seismic loading. Uh, and this was under two grants from CMMI. And then the RAA Fulton School of Engineering that funded some of this work through my Fulton chair. And with that, um, that concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ed, for a wonderful talk. And um, overdue thanks, I should have said that at the beginning, for entertaining the idea of doing this virtually. I know sitting in your office, speaking is, uh, and imagining people who are listening is, is kind of intimidating for anybody. And, and you just have to imagine the uh, applause that you're getting from around the country from the many uh, participants who are here from near and far. I'll seize the moment to do as promised and say, if you need a, a PDH certificate, now is your moment to click yes on the poll and we will collect up all of those who said yes and send you a, uh, fairly generic, I'm afraid, but uh, nevertheless effective, I think, for bookkeeping purposes, PDH certificate. If you have any questions, 
the Q and A is still open. There are questions there already, but please uh, post your questions in the Q and A, and we will get to them in due course. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, Alessandro Rotolaria has been monitoring what's happening with the questions, and he's hopefully ready. Um, first experience for all of us. Uh, to, to manage the questions. And then also I'm here with uh, Professor Giuseppe Buscanera, who, uh, who isn't managing the questions, but is welcome, of course, to answer questions on his own and can see what people are, are, are asking. So I'll turn it over to, to you, Alessandro, and you, Giuseppe. Thank you. Yes, so we will see uh, to which extent I really manage the questions. Anyways, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the inspiring and rich uh, lecture, Professor Kevin's engine. Uh, we have received a number of questions. Uh, I would start with one from Professor Patrick Fox from Penn State. Um, he is asking what was the time dependent waste decomposition relationship using your cellular model? And if this was uh, temperature dependent? Good question. Um, it's, a, it's a first order kinetic uh, rate dependent model. And the temperature dependence would come in with the kinetic rate constant. So uh, the way we would account for temperature de dependence would be to adjust the kinetic rate constant. OK. Um, so Professor Fox, if you, if you would like to, 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 to further comment on that, don't hesitate to, to write. And we will try to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, so I maybe, since we're talking about temperature, if I can follow up on, on a question. Um, related to this. So based on your experience, is temperature like a key variable for the performance of, of, um, of yeah. systems or, or not really? You know, um, temp there, there are two things I think that temperature can do. Temperature actually increases the yield strain in the geomembrane. So that would be a good thing, <laughs> um, as long as you maintain that high temperature. Um, but the other thing is it can also uh, increase the rate of degradation of the polymer. Um, so, you know, Carrie Rowe has done some um, landmark work on degradation of HDPE and at higher temperatures, when you get up to 80 degrees C, it significantly reduces the lifespan of the high density polyethylene, uh, makes it more susceptible to distress cracking. So. Yes. Um, I think there is a need to control temperatures uh, in order to uh, preserve the longevity of HDP. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so then go going forward, the, um, so the second question is if from Douglas uh, Diefenthal um, from a um, company in the greater Chicago area. Um, and the question is whether uh, slow stability programs are of any use in analyzing geosynthetic performance of length liners. Well, absolutely. You still need to check global stability, you know, both the interim and long term. And, and you know, if you're going to do a seismic analysis, you, you probably need a yield acceleration. So uh, limited equilibrium slope stability are still very valuable tools. Um, so uh, absolutely. But they're not going to tell you what the stress is in the line. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Um, then to continue, a further question from uh, Matt uh, Breitenbach. Um, and the question is whether do you see state uh, regulatory agencies starting to accept or implement these methods of analysis and recommendations for design or, or not? Good question. Um, you know, I'm 15 years removed from dealing with regulatory authorities. I left consulting practice 15 years ago. Um, I, I would hope so, but, but I don't, you know, I, mean, I think a lot of this stuff is, is fairly, fairly, well, I think there has been a lot of discussion about reforming construction quality assurance practices. You know, we, we go to great lengths to create a geomembrane that uh, we, you know, we, we non-destructively test every inch of seam that has these intact seams. And then we go and we cut chunks out of it every 500 feet. You know, how reasonable is that? Um, and so I think there's been a lot of discussion and I think people are starting to accept the fact that maybe we can reduce the frequency that we take these samples. And we need to be more judicious at the locations where we take the samples. So I, I think there's growing acceptance of that. Um, some of these other findings, you know, the findings on, on uh, increasing tensile stresses in the post-closure period, that's been submitted for publication. So it's a little early. Um, 
But I would hope that, and, and whether the regulatory agency pays attention to it or not, I think the design engineer needs to pay attention to it. You know, Even though it may not be required from a regulatory perspective, we have a responsibility um, to provide uh, environmental protection. So I think it's something we just all need to be aware of. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so um, the following question is if, so we come back to temperature. And so a question from uh, Chu Ho is whether temperature influences and temperature effects are more significant at the top uh, or the bottom uh, mm -hmm. of the geomembrane. Yeah, I, I think it's probably more significant within the um, within the body. Um, you know, up at the top, you're going to get come into equilibrium with the ambient temperature. So maybe it depends on where you are. If you're in if you're in Arizona and it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit and there's some exposed geomembrane, um, then you've got a pretty significant temperature effect. But if you can cover it with a couple of feet of soil, you know, it, it's going to moderate it down to 70 Fahrenheit or you know 20 degrees centigrade. The the, the what we're seeing with these large landfills is the, the interior of the landfill is, is, is becoming a heat generating um, um, engine and, and it's propagating the heat throughout the landfill. And I think it has a harder time dissipating down at the bottom. The le leachate seeps down, the leachate is hot. So I would suspect, and, and I'm not an expert on that. Um, Jim Hansen and others have looked at, at temperatures and landfills, but I suspect it's a bigger issue at the bottom. Okay. Thank you. Um, then uh, Beth Richer is um, asking how, if at all, do these findings uh, relate to liners installed on historic landfills, uh, which have already undergone settling, as a matter of fact? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and there's, you know, um, there's nothing we can really do about those. You know, that's a challenge. So it argues for continued monitoring um, in the long term uh, and, and, and then taking corrective action if corrective action is necessary. And fortunately, you know, the regulations do require uh, landfills to have financial assurance for um, corrective action, in the, even in the post-closure period. So I don't think there's much we can do about that. Um, we're not gonna dig up the landfills and, and, and pull up the liners or even inspect the liners uh, if they're under any significant depth of waste. Um, so it just argues for, for robust monitoring of the landfills, even if it's lined. Thank you. Um, then a further question from uh, Aries uh, Uigar. Um, and the question is, how would you approach modeling uh, interfaces between geotextile reinforcement or GCL and geomembrane? Yeah, that's good, good question. Um, so, uh, you know, we have done some analyses where we've, we've used the entire sandwich. Um, <laughs> it takes a lot more time. Uh, it takes a lot, much more detailed mesh. Um, uh, but but we have and we we tend to find that it's that lowest interface strength and the interfaces above that that tend to govern. Um, so uh, once you get that weak interface in there, uh, uh, that interface and the the geosynthetic material below that interface is what's going to and anything above it is what's going to govern. But you don't need to go more than one layer down. So if you have that like uh, geotextile slip layer. Uh, or a geonet, you're counting on the geonet as a slip layer, then you really just need to consider the material beneath it. That, that's what our results have shown to date. Um, but we haven't done extensive analysis of that because that's very, it's a pain in the neck <laughs> and very computation intensive. It, it doubles, triples the number of elements in the mesh and, and just creates, um, makes it more burdensome. Speaking of pain in the neck, I was curious, I'll, I'll uh, get my question in now. You touched on out of plane effects and maybe you did actually mention something about three dimensionality, but that's, a, that's an easy question to ask, I guess, which of course is highlighted in your talk is, are, are three dimensional analyses necessary? Can you, can you get away with 2D? Are there pitfalls where yeah. 3D might be necessary? You know, I haven't done any 3D analysis, so I can't really respond to that. Um, I don't know how these consisted, these advanced constitutive models would transfer into, into a 3D framework. That would take a lot of coding and a lot of thought. Um, and I think fortunately, most landfills, um, the way they're designed, you know, plain strain um, assumptions are probably uh, pretty good. You know, usually have fairly long slopes that you can take a slice through and treat as a representative. 
but that being said, I, you know, I don't know that there, there may be some unanticipated, some, you know, unobvious 3D effects that, 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 that do have an influence. Um, one of the things about corners, though, is, is it, it, it's often tough when you have corners and angles uh, to stick with fusion suits. <laughs> you often wind up, you know, when you have odd angles and all uh, with some extrusion scenes. And, and, you know, we prefer, I, I think, you know, it's been recognized by a lot of people that, that, that fusion seems much, much preferable to the extrusion seams, but we just can't use them everywhere. Yeah. Perfect. And Ed, I, I would have a quick question. It's more of a curiosity about the Cam clay model augmented for um, municipal solid waste. What's the controlling variable that defines, you know, the additional settlement, the additional strain? Is it the mass loss? Because, you know, in a problem so complex, uh, you can think of many things, right. fluid content that increases, degree of saturation, temperature. What, what would be the key element? So in our mo model, it's, it's volume change that's due to both decomposition and, and mechanical creep. So void ratio, basically, um, void ratio are the solid phase. Um, and, and the two things that contribute to that change in void ratio are, are the, the decomposition and the creep. And previous analysis, you know, when we first built that double yield surface model, it was for soft clay. So we were only concerned about creep. So now we've introduced the decomposition, but we haven't introduced the second yeah. yield surface yet. That's yeah. the next. Thank you. And maybe as a... Um, further follow up from um, Aries UER, um with respect to the discussion about interfaces, um, would your considerations hold if you were to use two layers of geomembranes? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by two layers. You know, yeah. if you had a double liner system, you know, it, it wouldn't just be two layers of geomembrane, right? You'd have a you'd have a drainage layer, and then maybe a cushion geotextile and a geomembrane. And then uh, probably a geocomposite, you know, drainage net, and then uh, another geomembrane, and and maybe a low permeability soil layer under that. And so now you got five, six, seven layers in the system. And um, again, I, I still think that the the what you need to be concerned about is down to the lowest interface strength, and then one more layer beneath that. I think. So I think there's still a lot of benefits to. Uh, designing your system so that one of those upper layers in the system has the lowest interface. And you can't always do that because, you know, stability enters into it. You just can't put a, an interface with a friction angle of five degrees at the bottom of the landfill because then it might not be, you, you might, you know, you limit equilibrium right, so that it's unstable. So sometimes you're kind of stuck, but trying to put that weak interface uh, as high up in the sandwich as possible, I think is, is, is a, would be my approach. Thank you. So I guess if there are no... I, I guess I'm saying one other thing yeah. too, though. So keep, keep in mind that the, when I talk about the weak interface, the weak interface is not the interface with the lowest post-peak strength. It's the interface with the lowest peak strength because that's the one that fails first. So, you, so the weak interface is the interface with the lowest peak strength. And then you use the large displacement strength of that interface as kind of the isolating interface. Thank, thank you, you, Alessandro. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you uh, thank you to both my colleagues. If, uh, unless anybody has an urgent question, I think we've uh, exhausted the ones that came through the Q&A. And I'll just remind people of what I submitted in the chat there is that we have an informal gathering with Ed, he agreed to that. And uh, Ed, there's one taker from, from abroad that has already said yes, came through in the email. You'll enjoy speaking to him, I think. Um, if there are any others who would, who would want to crash our party <laughs> at one o'clock and you've hung on to the bitter end they, uh, and, and you have the, the privilege of hearing this message, send me an email and I will send you the link. By the way, by the way, Jim, your chat said, you missed the dust, you missed the zero. Your chat says student participation fund uh, matching gifts up to $125. No, it's actually up to $125. It's any amount until that $125,000 is, is, is matched. Yes. Yes. And I'm glad I, I at, thought at any I, amount. I mean, $20 would be appreciated, you know, any amount. You know, we get 100 people giving $20, we've got, you know, $20,000 and I'll match it. 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I see I, I, my mistake. Glad I got the comma in the right place in order to get the order of magnitude of your, your uh, great contribution there. But my, my soul is clean. Uh, you know, people are, are, have left. We should have emphasized this, uh, this sooner, but there's quite a few people here. I, I, I put in my donation. Please put in your donation too, and, and Ed will match it. Um, I'm seeing a few things coming through the Q&A here. And uh, we have one more question. I, I, I think, uh, should we wrap it up or do you want to uh, answer that one, Alessandro? We can answer think? one more, I'm not in any hurry. Cool. Well, let's, let's I, I, can, I can mention this. Uh, Douglas uh, Deventhal has said, concerning 3D analyses, embankment designs often camber the embankment to correct for settlement. Wouldn't 3D analysis is what's typed in there. Do you want to speak to that? Become very important. Um, yeah. So uh, sometimes what we do in, in the landfill is um, we put a little bit, we, we build the waste up a little bit higher than the permitted final elevation and we let it settle. Um, and, and that's necessary for a couple of reasons. Well, one, it gets us a little more capacity if they'll let us do that. But it's actually necessary from an engineering point of view um, for fear that you might reverse drainage grades. Um, so you really want that kind of camber on, uh, upward camber on the top so that as it settles in the post-closure period, you, you don't reverse the drainage grade and, and start ponding waste on top. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you want to take that into account in your analyses. Um, uh, you know, and, and you know, one of the things we could do with the model, maybe there is a, there, there are some waste placement sequences that could uh, serve to minimize tension. I don't know, um, but it, it's it's worth a thought, and and it's something we would have to look at. But it, it certainly something that we could look at with the model. That's a nice thing about the numerical model, right? You can do a lot of what ifs. Yes, thank you. So thank you for all the questions. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you finished that one too. I dribbled out of the next line. Um, I just want to end here by saying thanks to you, Ed, enormously for accepting this invitation to present despite the kind of unusual format that you know, maybe may some are embracing, but I know we here uh, <laughs> would much rather have you here in person than to, to host you for a for kind of a, a bigger trip, more extravagant trip, take you out to dinner and so forth. Uh, one day we'll get to do that. Um, and thank you to everyone who, who typed questions and, for, and uh, everyone who participated today. With that, um, we'll say uh, thank you and see you to a, to a select uh, number of people here at one o'clock. Thanks again, Ed. My pleasure. Take care, everybody.